chew, man-sized wads of great tasting shredded bubble gum stuffed into a giant Stay Fresh pouch. The one billionth pouch. I said, what do you think of the idea of chewing gum or making gum, shredding it so we can look like we're the, the tough guys, but we're, we're just chewing bubble gum. We can have fun, look like he-men, and, <laughs> and, but not lose our lunch. And Jim said, I love that idea. Again, like it's a movie. Philosophy major meets a business guy with a big league career behind him. On a handshake, we became partners. And that's reve rent. revenue for one year for Big League Chew compared to buying the, the Chicago Cubs franchise. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> what does it say? Yeah. Has it been announced yet, or is that a new thing? No, it stays here. Okay. Yeah, no, you can see. You, you, you're you're, you're you don't have to delete you're it. Here it's first. okay. Out to center. This is Kranks. It's way back. It is gone. All right, welcome back to the Couch GM podcast. Today we have on Rob Nelson, who is one of the founders of Big League Chew, the iconic gum brand that we all chewed growing up. It's still massive around the world. They sold their billionth pack last year. We have a great conversation talking through his background of how he started the gum, all the different flavors that they have, a new flavor that's coming out this holiday season, as well as some other entrepreneurship type things. He's creating a board game. So hope you enjoy the episode and thank you for all the support. And this podcast is sponsored by myself. I am a mortgage loan advisor, mortgage broker full time. If you're thinking of buying, selling or refinancing in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM, or visit brokerconnorweb.com to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. This podcast is also sponsored by Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. Rob, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. We already uh, found out that Ground Ball Grape was his favorite flavor, and we're housing a pack right now to start off the show. Yes, we are. It's as good as it's ever been. Probably better. And you were saying that uh, the texture is different with Ground Ball Grape. Is that right? For me, it feels a bit more leathery, and uh, the bubbles get bigger. Okay. It's just, you know, anecdotal. So if you're going I haven't done any research. So if you're going for the record, you're, you're going with the grape. Ground Ball Grape. I want to ask you a question. A few people have asked me about ground ball grape. Like, why isn't it Grand Slam grape? Like, more heroic? I said, if you look at the pouch, it's a left-handed pitcher, which I was, and I live for ground balls. So you can't have Grand Slam grape if you've got a pitcher on the pouch. It just doesn't <laughs> work, right? Yeah. As a fellow wrote in, it was really funny. He said, if this were a basketball gum, ground ball grape is like outlet pass orange. You know, it was just bland. Yeah. It, it just doesn't get it. Ground ball grape is like, nobody says ground ball grape, except Big League Chew. Corey Seeger, when uh, somebody went through his, they did one of those uh, what's in Corey's cubicle kind of thing. Yeah. And he had like five sleeves of Big League Chew, like 60 bags. And it was all <laughs> all original stuff. And the, the person doing the interviewing said, what's with the original Big League Chew? And so when he was in high school, he only chewed ground ball grape until they got to a state tournament when all he hit were ground balls. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went cold turkey, stopped chewing ground ball grape, and he went to original. And my feeling was it didn't matter what flavor, as long as Corey was chewing it, I felt really good about that. That's awesome. There's yeah, it's a, fun. There's a ton of different directions I, I could take this. I guess to start with that, the the, the flavors, and and also the, the start of the, the gum in general. I'm curious how you made that first batch, you know, the steps after that, wh what the next flavors were, how those were decided. You know, the whole thing is kind of like a movie in that I was in the bullpen and uh, talking with Jim Bouton, former New York Yankee. We were Portland Mavericks. It was in Portland, Oregon when I came up with the idea, summer of 77. And uh, we were looking at teammates chewing the other stuff. And I, I, I tried the, the brown stuff once, and it just never worked for me. And Bouton had said, you ever chew? And I said, tried it once. I remember the guy who gave it to me, Danny Smith. I was in Johannesburg at the time. We are in South Africa, going through Rhodesia in South Africa, 1976. I said, I'll never forget it. I couldn't throw BP. He said, hey, Nelly, you got to try some of this. It was just terrible. So it just kind of stayed with me for a long time. And then as luck would have it, one of our bat boys, Todd Field, who's a writer, director in Hollywood now, he's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. At the time, he's 13. 
I walked into the clubhouse, and, and he's dipping into a pouch of Red Man. I said, what are you doing? You're 13 years old. He said, relax, Rob. It's licorice. I cut it up with scissors, and it uh, makes me look good. <laughs> uh, I, I said, what, you're trying to impress the girls in the stands? And he said, well, yeah. You know, so Todd was a player even as a 13-year-old. <laughs> and we didn't think too much about it. Maybe a day or two later, I said, you know, I don't think guys chew licorice playing a ball game. I said, it works for you, and I know you're going for the effect. But I said, I bet bubblegum would be better. And Todd said, yeah, you're probably right. We never thought about, like, we're making history kind of thing. Yeah. So you were 13 at the time also? No, I was 20, 28 years old. It was 1977. Okay. okay, yep. I met Todd. I didn't make the Portland Maverick team when I first went out there for the tryouts. So I asked Bing Russell, would he mind if I started a baseball day camp? I didn't want to go back to New York where I grew up. Because I just fell in love with Portland. Mm -hmm. I was only there like a week. I said, no, this place is great. <laughs> Reminded me of Ithaca, New York, where I went to, where I went to college. It's like a small town with big league, you know, accoutrement. Mm -hmm. And I said to Bing, I have this idea. I wrote a paper when I was in college about a, uh, a baseball day camp on public land. And uh, I told him all the details. He said, we can do that. He called the Park Bureau. He called the Oregonian. I got there in mid-June 1975. By mid-July, I was coaching 100 kids at Grand Park, wow. thanks to Bing Russell. Okay. You know, Bing, of course, is the father of Kurt Russell, the actor. Kurt and Bing owned the team. Anybody could try out, and that's why I went there. I'd been pitching overseas. My dad sent me a clipping that said, anybody can try out in Portland when you come back from this season, because it was winter ball. Go out to Oregon, see what you can do. That's how I ended up out there. And so the baseball day camp gave me enough money to stay there until I finally made the team in August. Todd Field was a kid in the camp. He was an 11-year-old kid, and he loved the whole Maverick mystique. He thought the guys were great. We were all misfit toys. We were the only team that was independent. Everybody else was a, an part of a, an organization. They were affiliated teams. So we had kind of an edge and kind of goofy guys, and... Uh, Todd loved the whole thing. He said, I want to become a bat boy. How do I do that? I said, you got to go to the tryouts like all the other guys. you got 300 guys trying out for 30 spots and probably a dozen kids trying out for three bat boy spots. So just go there, work harder than everybody else. I bet you get the job. And he did. So that's why he was there. That's, and again, there's the whole happenstance. Had I made the team, I never would have started the day camp. I never would have met Todd Field, yeah. who remains to this day one of my best friends. I mean, he's 60 years old now. He's got 12 Oscars nominations under his belt. He's wow. just, he's kind of a big deal. <laughs> but he's still the same knucklehead that I always knew. You know, yeah. when he was 11 and I was, you know, 26. So, uh, fast forward, go, going back to the sitting in the bullpen with Jim Bounton, uh, he said, I said, what do you think of the idea of chewing gum or making gum, shredding it so we can look like we're the, the tough guys? But we're, we're just chewing bubblegum. We can have fun, look like he-men, and, <laughs> and, but not lose our lunch. And Jim said, I love that idea. And then he said the key words. To my whole life, the key words Jim Bounton said, I could sell that idea. Jim had pitched for the Yankees. He'd pitched in the World Series. He was an American League All-Star. He wrote the book Ball Four, the largest selling, the best selling sports book of all time, baseball book. Wow. And just a really articulate and smart guy and a businessman. I had a degree in philosophy and I was teaching middle school when I was over in South Africa. So I didn't have much of a business background. Again, like it's a movie. Philosophy major meets a business guy with a big league career behind him. On a handshake, we became partners. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing was another great question he asked me. And I answered his question with a question. He said, what would you call it? And I said, uh... Uh, I, I don't know, Big League Chew? Like, you know, my voice going up, like, what do you think of that? <laughs> and Jim's guys got, like, baseball size. And he said, that's pretty good. But Bouton, being the businessman, he said, give me, give me a list of 20 names tomorrow. And I can't find the sheet of loose leaf paper. Yeah. I had Red Steer Chew, Rose City Chew, Bullpen Bubblegum. We had a bunch of names. None of them were as good as, as Big League Chew. So... Jim put down 10 grand. And again, going back to say, right time, right place, another kid in the baseball day camp was Scott Chernoff, 
whose dad was a patent and trademark attorney, Dan Chernoff. Cornell guy, where we both had gone to school 10 years apart. And I met him at an alumni, a Cornell alumni thing at the Multnomah Club. He's got his name tag on. I said, you got to be Scott's father. Because he's about 6'6", six, six, and Scott was 11 years old. He was 6'2". He said, I am Scott's father. Who are you? I said, I'm Coach Rob. I run Little Mavericks. He said, oh, I love that camp. This is a... And we became fast friends. When I told him about the idea, I got, I got a tutorial on, on intellectual property. Oh. He said, you can't patent shredded gum hmm. any more than you can patent chopped meat. So he said, McDonald's doesn't own a patent on hamburgers. But they do own Big Mac, Quarter Pounder, and, and right. all those things. And he said, plus they have what's called trade dress. It looks a certain way. I showed him the drawings I had, which are pretty much what the pouches look like now, except professionals did it, you know, not some left-hander with a, a Sharpie. <laughs> and, uh, and we went to business. And Jim was going door-to-door -door back in New York and Boston and so forth to try and find a gum company that could do it, make shredded gum. And companies, companies would say dopey things like, yeah, we don't make anything like that. And Jim said, that's why I'm here. That's the you point. know, you might want to try something different. Yeah. And uh, he, he called me back. He was in New Jersey where he lived. And I'm still in Portland. Now I'm working with Jugs Pitching Machines. I'm doing advertising, uh, just trying to make ends meet. This is after the last season was over, summer of 77. And he said, Rob, nobody understands what I'm talking about. You've got to make some samples. So I didn't quite know what to do. I'm reading People Magazine, January 1979. There's a guy who has a company in Arlington, Texas. Make your own bubblegum. I order a case of this stuff. And I get some root beer extract from the Hollywood, not Hollywood, the Stadium Fred Meyer, and also maple flavored. We went to Todd, back to Todd Field's house because, you know, typical ball player. My kitchen was pretty spare. Mrs. Field, Candy Field, what are the odds? We made the first batch of Big League Chew in Candy Field's kitchen. Her name is Candy Field. And Todd's mom, still there. She's 85 years old. I <laughs> see her once a month. It's awesome. She was just the best. I took the formula. They look, it looked like when I put it, I had to bake it. It looked like kind of thin brownie mix. And... Followed the recipe, threw it in the oven, got it out, and I took a pizza knife, one of those round things, and just rolled it until it was, <laughs> it was a bunch of shreds. Stuffed it in a pouch, uh, emptied some red man pouches, had a, an art company draw up what I kind of thought it would look like. Mm -hmm. You know, prototypes don't have to be perfect. Right. Yeah, they're prototypes. And uh, Jim went out trying to sell brown bubble gum. I was coaching at Portland State at the time. They, they still had baseball then. I was the pitching coach. And the first guys who ever tried the first batch of Big League Chew were the Portland State Vikings. Okay. You know, it's a pity they dropped baseball there because it was a heck of a program. A lot of good people there. But every I think back in it now, it's probably 10 years later, it made me laugh to myself. All the guys on the team, Steve Candelo, assistant coach, Gary McGraw is a scout for Texas Rangers. Now Jim Kaufman's a scout for Oakland A's. The, the Portland, Portland State Baseball was like the college version of the Portland Mavericks. There were a lot of misfit toys, community <laughs> college transfers, guys who tried other schools, didn't work out. And Jack Dunn gave him an opportunity. Jack was a lot like the Bing Russell of college baseball. But every one of the guys said, Rob, this is a great idea. Not one guy, when I look back at it, said, this tastes really good. Because it didn't. It was pretty <laughs> rubbish. Just kept at it. And sure enough, Jim found a small division of Wrigley uh, outside of Chicago, Naperville, Illinois, uh, Amaral Confections. Mm -hmm. And they made things like bubble tape, Mork from Orc bubble gum, Ouch bubble gum, look like a Band-Aid. They made gadget mm -hmm. gum is what I call it. They had one that was supposed to be a really big deal called Chew Bops. They looked like record albums, and the packaging looked like a small album. So they thought the, the, the packaging would become like a baseball card collectible. Mm -hmm. And it never took off. It was there maybe a year or two. But Big League Chew, they said, we'll give it a shot. And there was an engineer there, a fellow named Ron Ream, who figured out how, how to make it so that the shreds don't stick together. And, uh, and the rest is history. 
First year, they sold $18 million worth of gum. We had a three-year contract with them. And uh, after the first year, they said, maybe we should <laughs> extend this a little yeah. bit. To, to put the $18 million in $1980 in, uh, in perspective, the following year, 1981, the Wrigley family sold the Chicago Cubs for $21.5 million. Wow. Big Lee Chew, 18 million Cubs, just a shade under 22 million. I and remember that, calling my dad saying the Wrigley family just replaced the Cubs with Big Lee Chew. And that's rev re revenue for one year for Big Lee Chew compared to buying the, the Chicago Cubs franchise. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> what does it say? Yeah. So anyway, we knew it, as my dad said, he was NYPD, a man of few words, but really smart. And he said, it's, it's just lightning in a pouch. And that, that's that's what it was. And then then, when, then we just went from there. I, I stayed with Wrigley for a very long time. Uh, Jim had other business interests, and he also wanted to expand the big league brand, and I didn't want to. I had said to Jim that, you know, our brand isn't big league. Our brand is big league chew. But Jim wanted to do big league sunflower seeds, big league caramel corn, root beer, and the like. Hmm. So we split. We had an amicable split. I bought him out. Took me almost three years to do it. But it was a risk worth taking. We didn't know if Wrigley was going to renew the deal. He was a bit nervous about that. Jim was. Uh, he'd moved from New Jersey to Western Massachusetts and had just built a house. And I think he just wanted to kind of go back to nature and, and simplify his life. So I became the sole owner, and I did it for a long time. And then in 2010, just before then, the Mars Company bought out Wrigley. And Wrigley was a behemoth, but Mars Wrigley was giant size. And that was kind of a niche brand. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think that it was a good fit. So I went to Wrigley, and it was like a ball player being a. I, I took my free agency a year early and tested the market. I found a great agent through a friend of mine at Wrigley. Paul Chive at Wrigley was such an ally for me. He now runs PAPS, which is pretty cool. Wow. He's a very good guy. And he. he he was always in my corner in terms of anything Big League Chew. He got he found me a fellow about my age, Bob Anderson, ready to retire. He said, you're going to be Anderson's last hurrah. The, the, it's be the last product he, he represents. And Anderson and I just hit it off. It's, it was, we were like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, and so now we're both in our 70s. And he just did me a huge favor. Found a small company outside of Buffalo, New York. And we are like 50% of the Ford Gum Company's business. And they've been great. They, they, they listened to me. In the later years when I was with Wrigley, I'd go to the Wrigley building because they absorbed Amaral into Wrigley. So it was a really big corporate thing. And I'd go to the Wrigley building. And at the door, they'd say, can we see some ID? You know, and I've been with them for a very long time. So I really didn't feel not especially welcome. It's just that it was, you know, business was business. When I go to Akron, New York, 20 miles outside of Buffalo, I feel like an astronaut. You get the full service. Oh, it's just awesome. Yeah. It's really great. And as luck would have it, New Era Cap is about 20 miles away. So we've got a collaboration we're doing with them now with Big League Chew, Major League Baseball. It's really one thing has kind of fallen into place after another. In but that, that that's kind of the whole thing in a summary. Yeah. Guy who's a school teacher in South Africa, comes to Portland, you know why I went to Portland is because I had I had one good year at Cornell, my senior year. I'd beaten everybody but Harvard, who won the Ivy League title, and Michigan State, who won the Big Ten. But the other six games, I had some good games, and I thought, well, I really like baseball more than I admitted. To have only one good year out of college, it's a good thing to be your last year, because <laughs> that's what you want to go with, go away with. Yeah. And I wasn't good enough. I didn't get drafted. You know, I didn't throw hard enough. I was a lefty throwing, spotting the ball, kind of like Jamie Moore. Yeah, sounds familiar. You know, uh, but not at, you know, certainly not at that level. And that's why I ended up going overseas. And Cape Town gave me a great opportunity. I ended up doing it in Sydney and also London. I was basically on the back of the gum once it got going. I just kept pitching because it's what I love to do mm -hmm. and coach kids. So, so the, the whole thing is just, it, it looks random, but like every opportunity that came up, it was a Dan Chernoff who came along, and before him, Bing Russell. And most importantly, my dad's saying, you ought to go do this. 
the funny thing, too, about being in your mid-20s, I go to Cape Town, and I'm, and I'm dealing. I'm striking out 10, 12 guys a game, throwing over 200 innings, over 200 strikeouts for the first year. Player of the year my first year. We won the national championship the next year. And I'm thinking, I'm like Warren Spahn. Like, I'm a late bloomer. I'm going to make <laughs> the big leagues at, like, 28 or 29. So when people ask me, did you go to Portland to have fun? I said, no, I went there to win 10 games in a half season and have the Yankees buy my contract. I wanted to be the next the next Whitey Ford. If you go look at the original pouch of Big League Chew, he wears number 16 because Whitey Ford was my favorite player. And I, I thought I was that good. What I didn't realize is that they couldn't hit the curveball in Cape Town. And they didn't have that many left-handers there. So it was my own hubris that I, that I thought it was me. When, yeah. in fact, no. When I went to the tryouts for the Mavericks, I threw three innings. I struck out four guys on a Wednesday. And the next day, the paper had headlines, something like, Cape Town Kids Gonna Make the Mavericks. It was all, it was all roses. No pun intended with the city of roses. <laughs> uh, and then that Saturday night, I got hit like a pinata. I mean, guys hit balls at, you, at nighttime. I think they're still <laughs> flying overhead. There's a kid who didn't make the team from Pittsburgh, Scotty Suffern. I've got to run into him. I've got to find him. In the internet, I probably can. He hit a ball off the wall at the Multnomah Club. It's probably 425 feet. You know, and that's when I realized maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. Yeah. But the great thing, again, going with the story about the movie thing, Kurt and Bing Russell just loved guys who loved baseball. And when I didn't make the team and I asked him if I could throw batting practice for 10 bucks a day, could he help me start a baseball day camp? Bing thought... This guy wants to play, you know, and, and so the more he learned about my background, community college guy transfers to the Ivy League. I mean, nobody does that. And so I've always had the kind of the good fortune that people were around and I came through at a couple of good moments to open the next door. We're here today at Dev's Coffee Bar in Battleground, Washington. They built this podcast studio. Shout out to Austin. And if you're like me and enjoy a nice caffeinated cup of coffee, then visit orderdevs.com. Use code COUCHGM for free shipping on your order. The blend of my choice is the deliciously optimistic blend. Definitely give this one a try. Now let's get back to the podcast. And now you guys produced your billionth pack last year, right? <laughs> a billion bags of bubble gum. My brother Ed's a school teacher, retired, special education teacher, 45 years. Hence his nickname, Special Ed. But Eddie said to me, you realize a billion bags is a thousand million bags of gum. He says, a boat of bubble gum, brother. I said, yeah. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? It adds up. And I like the work that I do. I do clinics. I would, last fall, I was November, I was down in Corpus Christi, Texas with... Uh, Jose Trevino with the Yankees. Mm -hmm. They gave him the keys to the city. He's from Corpus at a bubblegum blowing contest. And it's just so much fun. Yeah. It, what amazes me is that whoever I've met in Major League Baseball, whether it was Cal Ripken or his brother Bill, Buster Posey, uh, just so many good guys. Ozzie Smith is the best because he was playing at Walla Walla and he played against the Mavericks. Okay. So when I'm up in Cooperstown, we're the official bubblegum in the Hall of Fame. We talk about the Northwest League. We talk about the Mavericks and how much fun it was to play a bunch of guns, a bunch of guys who look like a Marine unit. You know, a little paunchy, nothing shaven, and and certainly uh, our dress code was was not what everybody else's was. And Ozzy Smith said it was a real education for the younger guys to play against hard nosed guys like the Mavs. It it helped the guys. It's funny because after the Mavericks, Major League Baseball eliminated the idea of independent mixing with affiliated teams. Mm -hmm. So you've got independent leagues now, but there'll never be another uh, another Portland Mavericks. I mean, it shows in the Netflix movie, The Battered Bastards, that that we are right time, right place, right owner, great collection of guys. And we, as Bing used to say, we led the league in fun. We put on a good show. We played good baseball. As good as, as well as we could. Always made the playoffs. Never won the championship. I always thought the end of the movie in Battered Bastards where we don't win the championship. We're going up against the Mariners team from Bellingham. Yep. They brought down some allegedly double-A guys to beef up their roster to beat us. I think that's true, but I, I can't say for sure. I didn't recognize the guys. 
but they turned a big league double play to end our season. And then we've got this big settlement where Major League Baseball wanted to bring a triple-A team back in. They wanted Bing to leave, and the rules of baseball were that a lower-level team has to leave, and some kind of settlement will be negotiated. They offered him $26,000, and he said, put a zero in the middle, and I'll leave. And so they end up going to arbitration, and he wins his 206, $206,000 in 1978, I guess it was by then. It's worth a couple of million dollars mm -hmm. for a single A team. Bing really set the tone for minor league team valuations. So a lot of owners should be grateful to Bing Russell. Uh, a lot of players, guys like me, we are grateful for what for what Bing did. That was the largest buyout of a minor league team in history. Up to that point. I think in in well, up until that time, yep. certainly, by a lot. Right. You know, minor league teams are going for, you know, five, ten million dollars now because the money's there, and, and people realize that there's a value to it. But Bing was a funny guy in that, you know, they didn't own any of the Portland Maverick trademarks, so I'm battling with some of that to get some of that on big league chew pouches. Nobody seems to know who owns it. They just wanted to go to give the fans an opportunity. Kurt needed a place to play because he had been hurt. He said, Dad, let's start our own team. It was, uh, it, it was, it was so much fun, and the but what I was going to say about the, the Maverick story, the film, it's a bit like Casablanca. We, we don't get the girl at the end, but he, he walks into, you know, the, the, the twilight with, and he says, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship with, I forget the fellow's name that he's with. So the Mavericks never won a championship, mm -hmm. but we won the hearts of the city. And Bing got himself a boatload of money. So in a way, we did. We went out with our heads held high uh, and... Uh, a whole lot of big league memories. Pretty yeah. terrific. Talking about the end of the Mavericks, that was 1977. That's correct. And at the time, the, the Portland Beavers came back, and at the same time, the Seattle Mariners were starting at the same time. That's correct. You know, when the when the, the Milwaukee... The Brewers. The Brewers. The Pilots. When the, pilot, when the Seattle Pilots left for Milwaukee, a Major League Baseball had a deal with Seattle. Basically said, don't sue us. We're going to give you a team. You know, within 10 years. And it was less than 10 years. It was, you know, the Seven years. 1978. And uh, the pilots were only there for one year. I don't know if you realize, but Jim Bouton, my partner in the gum, pitched for the pilots. Did he? Okay. He it, The book Ball Four is based on his diary as a Seattle pilot until he got traded to the Houston Astros. Oh, okay. Jim passed away about five years ago, and... I flew back for his memorial service. It was up in Western Massachusetts. And I left my brother Ed's house in the Hamptons, in Hampton Bays on Long Island. I didn't take the ferry. I went the slightly longer way because I had Jim's book on Audible. And for the five-hour drive, I just listened to my partner basically talk to me for five hours. Wow. And then they had to speak. And, and I did pretty good. And Jim's widow came up to me. Paula came up and she said, you had no notes. How did you do that? I said, Jim coached me for five hours. I took the best of what I remembered from that trip. It's a, if, if you're not into audible books, and I am because I drive a lot, mm -hmm. the Bouton book is it's so good because Jim reads it not like a professional narrator. He's reliving this thing. He's laughing at the funny parts, and, and, and there are some sad moments there. Tragically, Jim lost a daughter in a car crash, and... He talks about everything. It's typically Jim Bouton. He didn't hold back on anything. And the book is a gem. But as a business partner, you know, he was the adult in the room. And I was kind of like the surfer dude, just looking for the perfect yeah, the way. Ideas. Except I was looking. Yeah, Jim used to say Rob had the inspiration and he was the perspiration. And I have to agree with that 100%. When yeah. people say, geez, you gave him half the business for $10,000? Wasn't that a lot? I said, absolutely not. Uh, we both did great. My dad had another great saying, how many cashmere sweaters do you need? You know, we've made, I made a pretty good living at this. I've got three kids still in college. I married late because I was a baseball junkie for so long. And uh, so it's worked out well. I have no complaints about it. I wish, you know, I got clocked at 96 on a kilometer gun. Yeah, I was going right? to say. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and the, my brothers are both of them. My brother Harry played a couple of years in the minor leagues in the Yankee organization. And he had the goods. He was a burly right-hander, threw hard. But he was one of the first to say, you know, it almost turned out better that you didn't have high heat because the life experiences of living 
on the beach in Cape Town, on the beach in Sydney, living in the, near the West End in London, I made so many friends. And when I taught middle school in Cape Town, I was 25 and the kids were 12, 13 years old. Those kids are all in their 60s now. And I still hear from about a dozen of them. Because wow. it was just like a magical year that we had this American teacher who didn't wear socks and a blazer and blue jeans. They said, wow, this guy is like, he's a rebel. It's hilarious. Do you know they've, if they still have those leagues throughout? Like, I didn't know South America or South Africa had a league. Uh, nobody's made the big leagues uh, from South Africa yet. number of guys have signed. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're, each province has a league. And then they have a big national tournament. It's like an all-star team. So Cape Town was in the Western Cape province. So I pitched for Western province against the Transvaal and Natal and Eastern province. Great situation. A couple of games a week. But for a pitcher, it was not hard to get 200 innings. It's six days rest. Oh, wow. Okay. You go from October, exact opposite here. You go from October to, to April. Uh, Australia, uh, again, timing for me. I pitched in Australia in the 80s before they got really good. I don't know if you saw yesterday, the number one draft pick. Travis Pizzana. Travis played youth league baseball under one of my teammates when I played at Sydney. And so my, my friend Larry Finkelson, who, who is Travis's coach, he said, Rob, uh, Travis has been true in big league true since he's nine. And so... I've met Travis and his dad, and just to, to be number one, number one, first round, first pick, is such a big deal. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a huge boost to Australian baseball that they, they are the real deal. I, they probably had a dozen guys in the big leagues in the last 10 years. I believe, I believe he's the first Australian-born player to be drafted in the first round of the draft. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. I'm sure that's true. Craig Shipley was a pretty good middle infielder. He's with... Maybe the Red Sox, maybe the Diamondbacks. I, I, I haven't kept up with them. Uh, there was David Nielsen, left-handed hitter with the Milwaukee Brewers. He's a pretty good hitter, too. Uh, but he, uh, I don't think he was drafted. I think he was a free agent. That brings me to another question on the packaging. Have you teamed up with any professional baseball players to actually you know, represent your brand? Have you thought about having an actual player on the package? I know that there was there would be you know affiliate to that. Um, have you had any cross pollination with that? It's a two edged sword because I own all the trademarks, so I get paid royalties. It's like mm -hmm. a record deal. You so call it a nickel a bag. It's not quite that, but just for entertainment's sake. And so there's no room for that. On the other hand, the only character, and I see you've got. I guess it's. We've got three different characters per flavor. Jim Swanson, left-handed catcher with the Portland Mavs, passed away about three, four years ago, and I put him on a pouch this year. Okay. And it's a great pouch. It's like a foul tip, and Swanee's got his helmet on backwards in the pouch, and you can see his name, Swanee, on the back with his number. It's a red backdrop for the in honor of the Mavericks. Uh, and Tanner Swanson, his son is the catching coach for the New York Yankees. He travels with the big club. And when I told Tanner I needed a dozen photos of his dad in action because I was going to put Swanee on the pouch, it's a, it's like Tanner's head just exploded. He was <laughs> so happy about it. And uh, so he's the only one that's based on a real character. So there's three different characters per flavor? And this they're kind year, of scattered, yeah. scattered throughout? That's right. That's exactly right. Now, going back to when you first started it, I'm curious, you know, the initial phases. It sounds like you got the, the trademark pretty quickly um, after you connected with, with his father. And then what was the initial marketing that you guys thought of? It sounds like he was going door to door almost trying to sell. Well, a, he was an trying idea. to sell the idea and the brand. And in terms of a marketing strategy, minimal. They just put it out there. There's a one commercial from the early 80s that so many people. Can even They know the words. You're in the big leagues when you're in the big league, too. Anyway, that's the only one they ever did. The rest of it was quite <laughs> quite literally word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Once it got in dugouts and guys said, here, try some of this, it, it just it just took off. Yeah. It, it had a life, life of its own. I'm not sure how it happened, uh, but I'm really grateful. It's a generational thing. I, I ran the Southampton Baseball School from the middle 80s, 1986, the year the Mets won it, 
up until about two years ago, with a little break with COVID, I did 35 years of a East end of Long Island baseball camp. So I'll be out to dinner or I'll be at a pub with my brothers and the bartender will say these beers are on the guy at the other end. And it's one of the kids who was 11 30 years ago. Say, hey, Coach Rob, I'm still lining up my knuckles. It's like, it, it, there's just a fun factor about it. It was mostly word of mouth. But the guys are in their 40s and 50s. It's a nostalgic brand. Mm -hmm. But if you're 11 or 15 or 17 years old, you're a high school kid, it's still the coolest thing they've ever seen. It's just It was just a feeling that I had. Going way back, people say, where do you think it came from in your head? When I was 11, my favorite ball player in the big leagues was Nellie Fox. My nickname has always been Nellie as a Nelson brother. Uh, Nellie Fox's bubblegum trading card, he had a big lump in his cheek, red man, and a big thick handle bat. You could hit with either end on a Nellie Fox bat. <laughs> my brother Harry used to say, if you broke a Nellie Fox bat, you could heat your home for the winter. It was just a <laughs> massive log. And I wanted to look like the, the real Nellie. So if I had an 11 o'clock Little League game on Long Island, I'd start chewing a log of bazooka, which is the way it came out. Little segments. Tootsie Roll used to have the same kind of thing. It was like mm -hmm. six or eight segments. And by 11 o'clock, I was game ready. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was a poser even when I was 11. And I had the Nelly Fox bat, and I hit to left field. No, I didn't know any better. It was like, you know, it was the, those guys were heroes, you know? And, yeah. and I think that's where it all came from in the beginning, because I can remember being... 11, 12 years old, and I had a substantial thing. And, and nobody said, what are you doing? They said, well, it's a little different. And fast forward to when I'm playing summer college baseball at St. John's University in New York in the Atlantic Collegiate League. I'm out in the outfield shagging fly balls with uh, a great friend, teammate, late great Rick Wolf, sportscaster, extraordinaire, writer, publisher, Harvard guy, really smart. We're just catching fly balls, and our coach, Al Goldis, comes out, who was a college coach at the time at New York Tech, became an Angels, probably five different organizations as a scout. He's in the Scouts Hall of Fame. And Al came out and said, I'm going to do a summer camp for kids next summer. Do you think I can call it the Major League Baseball camp? And Rick, smarter, smartest of the three, said, there's no way, Al. They've got that protected, I'm sure. I said, Nelly, what do you think? And I said, I bet you could call it the big league baseball camp. And that always stayed with me. Okay. When Jim Bounton asked me, what, what would you call the brand? I just plucked it out of the air. Big league chew. And the chew thing, I didn't even realize, you know, just kind of a double meaning. Mm -hmm. That chew means to chew, but it also means, you know, the brown disgusting stuff. <laughs> it took some heat from that in the beginning. People thought it was like a gateway product. I said, no, no, it, it's, it's like a bottle of root beer. You know, it, it, it's a fun, harmless alternative. And how to deal with that. Rumors went out that Big League Chew was owned by some tobacco company. It was all nonsense. But as of last year, government statistics, the consumption of chewing tobacco in a pouch, red man style tobacco, has dropped by over 75% since Big League Chew came out. I don't think I'm responsible for any of that. I think that players are smarter. They have agents. They have nutritionists. You got stories like Tony Gwynn. You know, I know Tony's agent, uh, John Boggs, he said that when Big League Chew came out, it's like it was, he was too late to the game that he had said, I'm sorry I wasn't chewing that during my career. And, of course, he died of mouth cancer. So there are a lot of smart people out there that the, the macho nonsense aside, there are other ways to, to basically – handle the saliva and all that stuff and Big Lee Chu did it I don't know I saw a play of the week last week a guy making a play blowing a bubble at the same time oh yeah terrific and I've seen more than one of those Ty France has a big bubble at first base a lot of the time yeah I, I just, Eugenio Suarez at third base you know there's something about bubblegum and and being childlike it's like it never gets old I mean I'm 75 now and it, it all seems like it was six months ago and I was seeing a statistic also that chewing gum helps re uh, reduce anxiety and stress. No so question. So if you're going up to the plate in a big situation, if you, if you got a little gum in your mouth, that could help reduce that anxiety for that at bat. I think it was LSU did a study on uh, 
on concentration and, and brain power, and that the recommendation was you should let kids chew gum during their finals. Release the stress. It just it does something to the brain waves. I, I don't know. All I know is the, the same thing with the, with the uh, 75% reduction in, uh, in consumption of, of tobacco in a pouch. I don't think Big League Chew is responsible for that decline in a big way. Certainly helped. But as my brother Ed said, you know if consumption of tobacco increased after Big League Chew came out, people would be all over me saying, see, look what you've done. Right. But now that it's like a three, 75% drop, I don't, very few people say it's a pretty cool thing that you did. I will say this. one: I, I met Tommy Lasorda, uh, an ABCA coach, American Baseball Coaches Association Conference in San Antonio. And the, the family that, that owns Ringer Shoes was tight with Tommy. Tommy used to wear Ringer Shoes. Because you like the family. I don't, I don't know if there was an endorsement involved or not. But he walked into an Italian restaurant, of course, in San Antonio. Who knew, right? He came over to our table, and, and Carol, the owner of Ringer Shoes, said, Tommy, I want you to meet Rob Nelson. He's, he's the big league shoe guy. And Lasorda was not young at the time. It was so great. He said, you know, it was like, I, I love when guys call me son when I'm 50, you know. Said, you know, son, you really helped a lot of guys. He kept a lot of guys off of the, the stuff that wasn't good for him. He said, that's pretty, pretty nice. And I just said, oh, I couldn't believe it. Just a, an unsolicited endorsement for exactly what I hoped would happen. Yeah. So uh, my brothers have a long time called me Lucky Lefty and none, none luckier than I. I mean, my gum is in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, my, that's insane. You know, my brother Harry said, you know, Rob would have loved to have his arm in the hall, but but he'll take the gum. At least, you know, I've got a little postage stamp, little tribute to Big League Chew in the hall. I always go visit it. So how did that happen, and when did that happen? Jeff Idelson was the president of the hall at the time, and uh, John Maroon was representing me for a lot of PR stuff. And John had done all of Cal Ripken's work during the streak. He was a one-man PR agency for Junior and when that, that year was over, Cal had said to Maroon, uh, you should go in this business. It was a one misstep the entire year. He said, you killed it, John. It was just amazing. So Maroon PR is out there, I don't know, 16, 18 years now. And with my Ripken connection, that's how I met him. John knew Idelson. He said, let's drive up to Cooperstown. And we, we had two meetings. The f I think it, we sealed the deal in the first meeting when we talk about Big Lee Chu, and I was talking about how the original guy wears number 16 because I always wanted to be the next Whitey Ford. And there were just a lot of whole, a whole lot of other baseball stuff in my, in my presentation. And Jeff Idelson said, you were clearly a game guy before you were a gum guy. And he said, this is a good fit. The other thing I said was, you know, Buffalo is three hours from Cooperstown. Uh, my two brothers and I, New York Public Schools, college, junior college, all through the state of New York. Dad was NYPD. We're kind of dyed in the wool New Yorkers. And, uh, you know, Ithaca, New York's not far from Cooperstown. And so to be able to go see my college team play and then pop over there. But, but the deal was done. Yeah. It, it, was, it was really cool. And I have this ongoing relationship with them. Uh, Ford Gum does a great job. They do a lot of work with USA Baseball, a lot of collaboration there. So we kind of, no pun intended, we touch all the bases. That, you know, the Cooperstown is like old school, but th they realize, the Ford Gum guys realize, and so do I, that the parents are taking the kids there. So it's like the torch has been passed kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You want to learn about Roberto Clemente? And I mean, I was there for the, the Negro League. Uh, exhibition that they had when they had the unveiling of the Henry Aaron statue. Uh, there's history and there's the past, but there's the present and there's the future. And I think baseball, probably more than any other sport, there's a respect for that with younger players that, 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 that they'll know about Mickey Mantle or Clemente or Jackie Robinson. You know, in a basketball, not so much, even though the trials and tribulations were the same. You know, the pioneer that Bill Russell was in the NBA. He went through every bit the hardships 
that Jackie Robinson did. But there's something about baseball. You know, there's no Field of Dreams type movie revolving around basketball or football. There's just something about baseball that has a dreamy kind of of component. Maybe it's because there's so much dead time in between pitches. You have a lot of time to shoot the breeze. I mean, Jim and I, Bouton and I, in the bullpen, just shooting the breeze. Yeah. And he said, what do you think of shredded gum? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Again, it's like out of a film. Yeah. Two guys have one idea, and, you know, 30 years later, we sell a billion bags of gum. That's insane. <laughs> Who does that? And the, the fun thing for me is that when I talk at schools, it wasn't easy for me. I mean, I was lucky, certainly, but... I'm the one who didn't make the team and had to come up with plan B. I don't want to go back to New York. So fast on my feet, I couldn't get a job, a job at Burger King or something because I needed to be at the ready. So at the Little Maverick camp, not only did I teach kids, but I took them to the ballpark that night. We sat behind the dugout. So I was around baseball people. Even after the Maverick thing, uh, when I got to work in advertising with Jugs Pitching Machines, I'm going to these coaches' conferences. I'm a meeting with guys I pitched against in high school and college and all the college. It's a big community. And it speaks volumes that you didn't get into, into this for the money. It was the passion in the sport. And that's why the hall of fame happened. You know, that's, that's why it really took off. It seems because there's the, the underlying passion of the game. And that's what. Th thanks for that. I mean, I, I, I believe that's true. I never got into it. Say, man, we'll be rich. My, my brother Ed had said after that first year when we killed it, he said, you're going to be rich and famous. And my dad said, Edward, I think we'll take comfortable and anonymous. <laughs> and except for Halloween, you know, when I'm giving out bags of big league chew uh, back in the day on 18th Avenue in Northeast Portland, I am pretty anonymous. I'm like, you know, my, my brother Harry calls me the, 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 uh, uh, B list celebrity you know? yeah, there you go. <laughs> at the local barbecue. Yeah, Rob's the gum guy, you know, that kind of thing. Unless you're wearing the shirt and, you know, that type of thing. But well, I love wearing the shirt around because oh, it's awesome. I, when I'm, whether I'm going through security in an airport, it's like, I'm really particularly proud of this one because I designed this one. Okay. I've never liked a lot of times you'll have an event like a tournament and there'll be a dozen sponsors and there'll always be a page that says, we want to thank our sponsors. Mm -hmm. So they don't have room for the whole pouch and stuff. They'll just say Big League Chew. And I never liked that it said Big League Chew and nothing after it. It was like a missing tooth to me. And then I realized that, well, 1980 is pretty cool. And <laughs> there's a, a jacket company in Portland. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's D-E-H-E-N. D -E -N, I think. And they make varsity jackets, leather sleeves and stuff. But their company is D-E-N 1920. Mm -hmm. And that's when they were created. And I took that idea because in the beginning when I drew this thing up, it had since 1980 or established 1980, just the numbers just themselves. Simple. Nike has done that. Well, I mm -hmm. think it's just Nike 1971 or something like that. And nobody's ever said, what's the 1980 stand for? You know, people can figure that out. Yeah. But I like that this is kind of old school with the distressed lettering and also no trim on it. It looks like somebody designed it in 1980. For sure. So this is my T-shirt of, of, of choice. I like it. Going back a bit, so the original flavor was technically root beer with the initial uh, gum that was made. And then when did you move to original, you know, the original flavor? And how are the next flavors decided on? They never made root beer. They never made, uh, what was the other one I had? That was just for the example, like when you're walking around, yeah. this is what we're going to do. And I had maple flavor too. I had root right. beer and maple. I thought the brand would be cool. Mm-hmm. They said, you stick to the ideas, the Wrigley people. <laughs> we'll make the gum, you stick to the ideas, yeah. But they went with the basics. In the beginning, Big League Chew was only original. Then they came out with grape uh, and then strawberry. And it was always three to two to one. If we had six, six bags, they'd sell three original, two grape, one strawberry. And now we've got like nine flavors. Mm -hmm. Sour apples, strawberry. Uh, we've got a, a new... Uh, Peppermint coming out for Christmas. Oh, you do have peppermint. You know, I love the that fact was one of the questions. It's that... going to be it's going to be pick off peppermint, and I had a pretty good move to first I like base. That. So they said, "What do you think of pick off peppermint?" And I said, "You guys have never seen my move. I'm a, I'm going to tell my brothers. Uh, they named it after me, and of course they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they came up with these. They're crazy about the alliterations. We had fans write in about when we came out with uh, blue raspberry." And a fan had written in and said, how about Rally Raspberry? 
And then I found out with the marketing, adults like raspberry, kids like blue raspberry. It's the same thing, mm -hmm. except that one's blue. So they said, what do we, and I said, well, how about big rally blue raspberry? Said, okay, done. And then I just get off because I've got that wacky side of me. I said, I like the BR thing. Two reasons. Babe Ruth, right? A little subliminal. And my friend Billy Ripken. Bill is going to like that. I'm going to tell him we did it because of him. There you go. And he's going to say, nah, I don't, I'm not buying. Has the peppermint been announced yet, or is that a new thing? No. It stays here. Okay. Yeah, no, you can say, you, you, you're you're, you're you don't it, have to delete you're it. Here it's first. okay. <laughs> what, what's it called again? Uh, pick off peppermint. Pick off peppermint. Coming soon. Okay. This holiday season. One would hope. That's awesome. We had a couple of years ago, we had one of my favorite flares was uh, hot chocolate. They didn't call it just chocolate. And it tasted like, have you ever had a Necco wafer? New England Confection Company. They had all different flavors, but they had, you could buy a whole pack of Necco wafers with only chocolate. And that's what the hot chocolate Big League Chew tasted like. I thought it was great. Apparently, I was the only one. <laughs> It was brown also, I, I imagine, right? It was, ba yeah, kind of tannish. I, I don't think, that ship has sailed. I don't think we went out of problem with it. Yeah. Uh, and But I just thought it was fun. Uh, pick off peppermint. What else do we have in the works? We'll probably eventually have some kind of tropical fruit thing. The new flavors is just, it's it's almost like limited edition kind of thing. Okay. And, and, and I like that. Are there any other limited edition flavors that you've had in the past? We had Cherry Sparks back in the early 80s. And Cherry Sparks was a great cherry Big League Chew. But it, it almost tasted like they chopped up Lifesavers and threw it into the into the batch, into oh, yeah. the mixture. Because there were little chunks in there. And yeah. I guess that was what the Sparks thing was all about. Okay, I'd love for them to come back with Cherry. And I think eventually we will. I uh, When it comes to those things, I really only have one vote. Uh, and there are other people that are Eventually you'll see... So you come up with a nickname for me. You know, Baltimore Chop Cherry. I, I don't know what the cherry would be. Yeah. What would you call it? Change Up Cherry. Yeah, Change Up Cherry is good. I like Not that. Bad. You got a guy throwing a circle change. You know. Yeah. Jamie Moyer on the cover. Sure. <laughs> sure. But then we'd have to pay Jamie. Right. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, so do you view, view yourself as like an entrepreneur or is it just kind of like, a, you know, this is just who you are now? This is just. Even when I was teaching school, I would come up with with math games and history games and stuff like that. I have a board game. Yeah, you mentioned the board game. I have a board game that's a cross between tic-tac-toe and chess. We'll probably do a soft opening of it in and around Portland around December. I just got the trademark for it, the U.S. registered trademark. The name of the game is Culls, C-U-L-L-S. Long history of why that is. But among other things, a cull is a one-armed lobster. Okay. And when I was a busboy and a dishwasher at the Lobster Inn on Long Island, Back in the late 60s, early 70s, I was enamored with the culls, and I just liked the name. And it applies somewhat to the game, because there's some culling that goes on, which means the, the, the separation of some of the pieces. Uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I've got a good partner in Rochester, New York, and uh, Bailey and I are working on this thing pretty seriously. I, I have some friends who've got math degrees, and, and I've got one, one fellow who's a retired a biochemistry professor uh, at Colorado State, and he's only beaten me. When we play a best-of-five series, I win four out of five, and he can't believe it. I said, well, you know, people always undervalue the philosophy students. We see the bigger picture. <laughs> so it's heavy The math. game only has two rules, and, and the first rule is you go first. So it's really, <laughs> really simple. So we'll see. That's my next big project. It's funny thing, my parents never pressured me. I mean, when I got out of school and was just trying to make my way through, making not much money in Cape Town or anywhere else where I was going, they, they never said, why don't you go to law school or get a real job? They never did that. But when Big League Chew was out for two, three years, my dad said to me over breakfast, he said, you need one more idea. You don't want to be a one idea guy. You got to come up with one idea. One and when wonder. he saw when he saw the early versions of my board game, he said, "I think your game is going to be bigger than the gum because it's not language based. It's a logic game, so I can go worldwide with it." And and so I'm kind of on a mission to prove my late great dad right that there it is. But we shall see. I've always done stuff differently. 
One parent on Long Island said that my baseball camp was like Seinfeld meets baseball. We just do wacky stuff. Dollar derbies and surprise flies and five strikes and you're out and foul balls don't count. And I'll bring out a baseball that's this big when the kid's <laughs> not hitting well. You know, we were kind of doing things the Savannah, Savannah Bananas are doing now. Okay. I was doing at my baseball camp. And all I wanted in my camp was to teach the kids a handful of fundamentals. Big Brother Harry says, my, my camp is like the in-and-out burger of baseball. Like eight or ten items maximum. How to line up your knuckles. Make an L because you love to throw. Just some basic cliches and then just do some drills and then go out and just play and play and play. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and a lot of that is Bing Russell 101. Uh, if it's fun and nobody's going to get hurt, give it a shot. See what happens. What's the worst that can happen? Well, all I know is that I had as much fun doing Little Mavericks baseball school and doing basically 12-hour days because I had the 9 a.m. session, the 1 p.m. session. Then I'd sit in the stands with the, with the, uh, the kids, and I'd get to sleep at midnight and just do it day after day. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, at the time, 26, 27 years old, I was so happy doing stuff I loved with people I loved. Yeah. And that, that's kind of been the Nelson Brothers mantra, again, basically from Gene and Harold, my mom and dad, that uh, make it have an impact. You know, the Jackie Robinson quote is one of my favorite, that, you know, life, life is unimportant except for the impact you have on other lives. And I think Brother Ed has done that as a special education teacher. My brother Harry, teaching math, became a college administrator, did a bunch of things. But the bottom line was always, let's see if we can make, make a difference, have an impact. I'm amazed how many people have a big league chew story. And it could be, I chewed big league chew and I hit a home run to win the game. Or I chewed big league chew and I got hit in the head, missing a fly ball. It's, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. People remember specific things. And bubble tape, created also by Ron Ream, the fellow who created uh, big league chew, Bubble tape has always sold at least twice as much as Big League Chew. Hmm. You can stack it up. It's at the cash register. It's more of an impulse item. But nobody says, I grew up on bubble tape. Nobody said, oh, i got a bubble tape story. The, the fact that my gum has, has created stories for people makes me happy. It's the same thing with my board game. I've given prototypes, and I'll get photos at Thanksgiving or Christmas where uh, they'll be at the Oregon coast. Or well, they'll be at a cabin or something, and the family's having a tournament playing what they used to call Rob's Game. <laughs> and uh, and my brother Ed did that with his special ed kids in high school. They had attention spans that were not terrific. They could play a Rob's Game tournament for two hours with a leaderboard and the you know, March Madness equivalent kind of thing. Yeah. It, it makes me happy that my board game makes people smile. And when, when the game is over, so I didn't see that angle. I didn't see that coming. There's a whole lot of banter that goes on. If you're ever down in Portland at T.C. O'Leary's, my favorite Irish pub, I'm down there about three nights a week just playing anybody who wants to play with me. It's basically beat the inventor, win a pint. I'll see you down there. Easy. Yeah. It's so much fun. And, but it's the same kind of thing. Whether it was the Little Math Camp, meeting guys like Todd Field, or uh, uh, you know, creating Big Lake Chew, Creating a board game, it just, the fun factor is, is paramount. Absolutely paramount. A very long time ago, I got to meet Bill Veck, who is the just iconic owner of the uh, Cleveland Indians, then the Chicago White Sox. He led the league in, in wacky. You know, had the first bat day. He had a shower out in Comiskey Park when it was too hot. You could just go there and drench yourself and then go get another cold beer. But Bill Veck is in the Hall of Fame. I got to meet him once, and then I discovered both he and I have a February 9 birthday, and I've always liked that. And then I found out John Cruck, also February 9. So uh, that, that day seems to help left-handers and people think a little differently. How much baseball are you currently watching still? You know, I, I watch highlights. I'm not that close to it. I, I got down to see some of the Corvallis games because, okay. of, yep. because of Travis. I watch local teams and stuff. Okay. Tomorrow, I'm driving up to Bellingham with the commissioner of the West Coast League. Yeah. Because uh, Big League Chew is pretty active in the West Coast League. And their all-star game yeah. is on Wednesday. Uh, Rob and I are going up. Uh, Nyra and I are going. We call him Rob the Younger. Uh, Nyra and I are going up a day ahead. We'll watch the all-star game on TV with a bunch of 
probably Corvallis Nights because they're, they're taking a whole bus up for that. So more with local stuff. The Portland Pickles, Alan Miller's team, it's just, it's the summer college Portland Mavericks. Mm hmm. I mean, they really do fun stuff. And they've a taken the community there. in southeast Portland at Lentz Park. Uh, it's it's just quite fantastic. So yeah. that's the kind of baseball I'm mostly interested in. I couldn't tell you who the top ten hitters are. I know a handful of things because of some of the people I know in baseball. I coached a kid when he was 10 years old in London, Brad Marcelino. He's 42 years old now, and he's a batting coach with the Arizona Diamondbacks. You know, so I... I my baseball interest is very centered on people that, that I know. And I have to admit, when people say, who's your favorite team or your favorite players, I said, I, ju I just cheer for any left-hander over 30. You there know? you go. Yeah. Because I'm one of them. Uh, I just happen to be way over 30. I played for the Portland Pickles uh, all-star team a couple times, which is uh -huh. not the Pickles, but mm -hmm. it's like affiliated with them. I, I tried to get Jamie Moyer to come play with us. Mark Lowe. I don't know if you've met Mark. Uh -huh. I haven't met him, no. Okay, so he was playing with us the other week. He's 41 years old, and he's still sitting 90 miles an hour, you know, just to get out there and compete. And It's terrific, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great time. It's really fun. Well, uh, Rob, really appreciate your time. Uh, hey, this, is, this awesome. is so much fun. I can do this anytime. Absolutely. It never gets old for me. And if somebody cancels on you, call me. It's a it's 40-minute drive. We'll, we'll just do a video to show off your board game down at the pub sometime. How about that? That'll be great. I'm not ready for that yet, but okay. I will be soon. When you are. Yeah. Awesome. Well, again, appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for this. This is fun. Awesome. Sweet. All right, that's a wrap. Out to center. This is great. It's way back, and it's good.